Good afternoon, everybody. A couple of things at the top. Today's announcement by Micron uh, is another big win for America. Micron is investing $15 billion over the next decade at a manufacturing facility in Idaho, and they directly credit the passage of the CHIPS Act that made this possible. Just this week, we've seen First Solar, Toyota, Honda, and Corning make major announcements of new investments and new jobs as a direct result of the President's economic plan. U.S. manufacturing is back. Americans have experienced an unacceptable level of flight, of flight delays and cancellations this year due to airline issues. When these disruptions occur, it's really difficult to figure out if you will receive a meal voucher and hotel accommodations. So two weeks ago, Secretary Buttigieg told the top U.S. airlines that our administration planned to publish an interactive airline customer service dashboard before Labor Day to give Americans more transparency about what airlines owe them when there is a delay or cancellation due to staffing or mechanical problems. Secretary Buttigieg also urged the airlines to immediately improve their customer service plans before the dashboard launch. Today, the Department of Transportation officially launched the dashboard and we're proud to report that airlines vastly improved their plans. And we have a graphic right behind me. We love graphics here, as you know. Uh, before the Secretary's letter, there were significantly more red X's across this table. None of the airlines had guaranteed that they would cover meals or hotels when they are at fault. Now eight of the top airlines cover hotels and nine of them cover meals. Before Secretary Buttigieg's letter, only one airline guaranteed they would rebook you at no cost. Now nine out of the ten do so. This is a huge win for American travelers. From the start of this administration, President Biden has directed his team to work with airlines to help Americans get where they need to go safely, affordably, and reliably. And we will not hesitate to hold the airlines accountable. If airlines aren't providing you with these services, file a complaint with the Department of Transportation. Our administration has your back. Lastly, I want to make a few comments on the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights report on Xinjiang that was released just last night. The United States welcomes this report, this important report, which describes authoritatively the abhorrent human rights treatment of the Uyghur and, and other minority communities by the People's Republic of China government. The report deepens our grave concern regarding the ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity that China is perpetrating. Our position on the atrocities in Xinjiang has been clearly demonstrated with our words and in our actions. The Biden administration has taken concrete measures, including improving visa restrictions, global Magnitsky Act, and other financial sanctions, export controls, import restrictions, and the President has rallied allies and partners, including the G7 commitment to ensure all global, global supply chains are free from the use of forced labor, including from Xinjiang. We will continue to work closely with partners and the international community to hold China accountable. And we will call on China to immediately cease committing these atrocities, release those unjustly detained, account for those disappeared, and allow independent investigators full and unhindered access to Xinjiang, Tibet, and across China. With that, all right. Go ahead, Zeke. What do you got? Thanks, Doreen. Uh, can you confirm that the United States is ending uh, humanitarian parole for Afghan refugees? And is the administration concerned that this is going to make it more difficult for people trying to flee the Taliban's rule to get, uh, get safe? So um, here's we have uh, an update on, on the enduring freedom, the, the Operation Allies Welcome, uh, what it looks like long term. This is an, uh, this is, uh, this is an update that, uh, that the Department, uh, that the that the Department of Defense announced recently. And so, look, our commitment to our Afghan allies is endearing. 
Uh, we have uh, welcomed nearly 90,000 Afghans to our country over the past year and have been providing relocation assistance over the past year as well. As part of our efforts to continue to welcome our Afghan allies, we are adopting a new model where Afghans' arrivals will travel directly to the communities where they will be moving with the help of refugee resettlement organizations without a safe haven stopover in the United States. We have also been pivoting toward welcoming Afghans from visa programs that have long-term durable status, such as the Afghan Special uh, Immigrant Visa, the SIV program, SIV programs, as you hear us call it, and refugee admissions programs, so that Afghans who are looking to resettle in the United States will remain with an immigration status that provides a path to long-term uh, permanent residence rather than a temporary status, which is what is provided through humanitarian parole. At the same time, we have been undertaking substantial effort to improve our rel relocation efforts, uh, working to make them more efficient. Uh, we are developing a system to help Americans with family members in Afghanistan, as well as Afghans who have arrived in the U.S. over the past year, bring their family members uh, to, the, to the United States. So we're going to continue to improve uh, the SIV pro uh, process and have substantially increased the number of staff processing uh, SIV application by, by more than 15-fold 15, uh, 15 since the beginning of the Biden administration. So this is important to us. This has been a priority, and that's how we're going to make this uh, process work a little but bit better. To the question, though, of, uh, is the administration concerned that this process, by, for, uh, by pushing people to that longer-term residency uh, visa program, that that's going to make it more difficult for people who are just trying to get out to get out, that the, the purpose of the parole was to allow people to get to the United States, get to safety quicker? So so we look. We know that many uh, many of our allies in Afghans uh, remain uh, in Afghanistan remain under threat in, in the country. So we are putting the infrastructure in place overseas to increase uh, the pace of our relocations, and we have made a number uh, of process improvements to refugee and SIV immigration process that should make this faster. So we believe it's going to make this faster. Uh, we believe this is an improvement in the in the process, and this is a commitment that we continue to have. And can you provide an update on the situation in, in, in Jackson right now, the federal support of what, what has FEMA been able to get uh, to the city thus far, and has the president spoken to the governor yet, and what's been the reason for the delay? So FEMA, just to give you a little bit of an update on what's been going on on the ground and from the uh, federal government, the FEMA administrator, Deanne Criswell, will travel to Jackson, Mississippi tomorrow uh, to assess the ongoing emergency response. Uh, as you know, the president took immediate action to improve, uh, to approve the governor's emergency declaration request and directed his team to surge assistance uh, to Mississippi as soon as he uh, got uh, uh, got the declaration uh, request. The president and vice president both spoke uh, with the mayor of Jackson yesterday. We read out uh, that from the president that they spoke, and FEMA administrator spoke with the governor earlier in the week. So FEMA has a number of personnel on site in the state in the state emergency operations center and is coordinating with the Mississippi Emer emergency management team to ensure that everyone has access to water. Uh, the EPA also has a subject matter expert uh, on the ground to support the emergency assessment of the Jackson water treatment uh, plants. The agency is also working to expedite delivery uh, of equipment needed to repair Jackson's water treatment plant. So we are doing everything that we can to make sure uh, that we're helping the people of, of Mississippi. Uh, again, we are in t close touch. Uh, we have had multiple conversations with the governor, and clearly we, we read out the, our conversation with the mayor, and uh, we'll continue to, to have those open lines. Lastly, for the, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the, the UN report on uh, China, China's genocide in Xinjiang. What, what, the administration's been planning a, a phone call between the president and President Xi, uh, sorry, sorry, a meeting between the, uh, pre uh, President Biden and President Xi in the coming weeks or months. Why is now the time after this report the time for, for a meeting between these two leaders to take place, given Chinese atrocities? Wait, say that one more time. You're saying, why shouldn't we have this well, meeting? You're planning a meeting right now. Why is are you, do you plan to go forward with that after this report? I, I don't have anything to read out about an upcoming meeting or or anything like that, any specifics of a meeting uh, that the president could potentially have uh, with President Xi. I just don't have anything to share. But there's been no change to the, the plan after they spoke on the phone a couple of weeks ago that they were planning to meet in person. That's that process. The there's, ju there's just nothing for me. There's not a process that I can speak or share with you at this time.
Thanks. You guys have talked about the president's speech tonight as one that's about the continued battle for the soul of the nation. Uh, Republican House Leader Kevin McCarthy said this morning that the president does not understand the soul of America. Since we're a year and a half into this presidency and the country is still so divided, could McCarthy have a point? So let me say a few things uh, about um, uh, the response to, to um, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, and it comes from himself, like what he said. Uh, on January 6, uh, t after January 6, 2021, one week after uh, after the January 6 insurrection, I'm sorry, January 13th, uh, and you know he said the violence, destruction, and chaos we saw earlier was unacceptable. He said this on January 13th of 2021. It was undemocratic. It was un-American. We all should stand united in condemning the mob together. And then he said. Uh, so he, And then he said, the president bears responsibility for Wednesday's attack on Congress by mobs, rioters. This is he's speaking about the former president. The president strongly agrees with Kevin McCarthy on the January 6th comments and the January 13th, 2021 comments, and does not find the comments that, that Kevin McCarthy made then to be divisive in the least, but rather aligning with fundamental nonpartisan mainstream American values that we uphold the rule of law, reject political violence, and condemn violence against law enforcement. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about protecting uh, our democracy, when we're talking about fighting our democracy. That was, those were the words of Kevin McCarthy. And he, the president agreed with that Kevin McCarthy. He agreed with the Kevin McCarthy of January 6. He agreed with the Kevin McCarthy of January 13 of 2021. And what we hear from him, uh, what we hear from him, of course, is a change of heart, uh, and even formally punished fellow Republicans like Liz Cheney, who've had the courage to consistently tell the truth about the attack uh, on the rule of law and the law enforcement that day, and continuing to the threat to democracy that these extreme conspiracy uh, theories represent. That is what we're talking about. And as far as what the president is going to say tonight, we've talked about this. Uh, when, when he talks about the soul uh, of the nation, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a topic that is new to him. If you follow him, if you follow him throughout this administration, also uh, through the campaign, this is a topic that he has talked about um, uh, for some time, since 2017. And, this speech, just to give you a little bit about what the speech is going to be about, it's going to be optimistic. He will speak about how he believes we can get through this current moment, this critical moment that we are we are currently in. He believes this is a moment where a lot is at stake. You'll hear him talk about the core values of what is at the stake in this moment and how he, we and how he is going to continue to protect, uh, for, uh, protect equality and democracy. He will also talk about in a very direct way about he, what he sees as a threat at this moment in this in time. Basically what Kevin McCarthy said on January 6, 2021, what Kevin McCarthy said on January 13, 2021, the threat of our democracy, that insurrection, that mob that we saw uh, come uh, come down on the Capitol. Just two quick follow-ups on that though. You, you're talking about Kevin McCarthy from from that day. We've obviously seen, like you said, a pretty big change of heart from, from uh, Leader McCarthy, you know, who has since really distanced himself from any investigation into January 6th, really stood lockstep with the former president. So I guess I'm asking about what's the president's relationship and thoughts about Kevin McCarthy today? Does he can does he have a relationship with him? I mean, he could very easily become the next Speaker of the House. Does he talk to him? Does does he view Kevin McCarthy as one of these MAGA Republicans who's a so threat to here, democracy? So here's what I'm going to say. I'm you know I've already laid out what I thought, what we think about. Uh, about uh, about Kevin McCarthy, we're not going to go into any more specifics on that. This is what, what we're talking about tonight is what the president's going to deliver to the American people, and and why it is important for why he sees it's important to have uh, this conversation. Why it is so important uh, uh, for to talk about what is at stake at this moment. Uh, you know, when you ask me about the mega agenda, especially as it relates to Congress, as it re relates to elected officials, uh, it is one of the most extreme agendas that we have seen. Uh, and it is a, a part of the, uh, it, is, it is the extreme part of, of the Republican Party. And we're talking about they want na nationwide ban on abortions. They want to give tax cut to billionaires and corporations while raising taxes on middle class Americans. They are threatening political violence and they are attacking our democracy. And so the president is gonna take this time to talk to the American people who majority agree with him on. 
and talk about you know, how can we uh, continue uh, to fight for our democracy and do it in an optimistic way. Take that moment uh, to, uh, to give uh, people hope because this president believes uh, that we can turn this around. Uh, thanks, Karine. Is tonight a political speech? No, it's not a political speech. This is an opportunity, again, for the president uh, to directly have a conversation uh, with the, with the, uh, the American people. Um, look, he's going to talk about, of course, he'll talk about the importance of engagement. Uh, he'll talk about voter, voter participation. But this is a speech about such a broader subject. Uh, you know, what it means to be a democracy and what it means to participate in our, in our democracy, given where we are as a nation. And he believes the stakes are very high. And that is important to go out and articulate what those stakes are and why it's important for people to participate in their democracy. And at the end of the day, why it is worth fighting for. And that is what he's going to talk about tonight. That's what you're going to hear from him. And it, again, it's a broader subject about this moment that we're in currently. Democrats and uh, people on the left are pretty happy about the more aggressive tone they're seeing from the president and from the White House. But you're also facing some criticism, which has been brought up, that this aggressive tone is also stoking the divisiveness that he's trying to heal. Any concerns about that? You know, the president's never going to shy away from calling out what he sees. And I said this yesterday, and, I, and I'll say this now. Uh, you know, I'm assuming the divisive tone is coming from, from, from whom? From the right. So, look, we understand we hit a nerve. We get that. We understand that they're trying to hide. And uh, we understand that ultra MAGA office holders uh, want to play games here and dodge accountability uh, for their extreme proposals and actions, but they're just telling on themselves. Look, the president has always, always squarely targeted his, his criticism uh, on elected leaders. This is about what they're doing uh, in Congress, those extreme uh, MAGA Republicans, uh, those who, who, are, uh, who hold office. Uh, the first time that the president said ultra MAGA was about Rick Scott's radical plan uh, to raise taxes on millions of, of middle class Americans and put Medicare on the chopping box, both Social Security on the pop chopping block. Uh, I just mentioned national abortions, that uh, ban that, that these uh, MAGA Republicans want to do. It is important to call that out. And let's not forget, when you think about Medicare, when you think about Social Security, those are popular things. When you think about Roe and protecting women's right to choose, those are majority of Americans support that. So, how, how, so that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about agenda that is not popular. We're talking about agendas that is incredibly extreme. We're talking about an agenda that is not in line where majority of Americans are. So yeah, the president's going to talk about that and he's not going to shy away. But again, this is going to be about a speech that will be optimistic, that will talk about participating in our democracy and how important it is to, to do that and how important it is to continue to fight. Just one quick brush of question. Does the White House have any intelligence or reaction to the death of the chairman of Luke Oil, <coughs> the second largest uh, oil producer in Russia. He'd been a critic. He apparently died after falling out of hospital window and was a critic of the war in Ukraine. Uh, I'm, I don't have a comment on that. We're certainly not going to get into any speculation on, um, on how he died. Okay. Thanks, Green. Um, going back to Jackson, yesterday you detailed <coughs> the myriad of federal funding sources uh, that could be used to address what we're dealing with right now. Are there any concerns, however, about you know, the difference between allocation and the money actually arriving in certain places about the process for Jackson to access that funding once the federal government is allocated and perhaps the state is dealing with the contracts with the grant applications? So you're talking about the bipartisan infrastructure law and the American Rescue Plan. So we, we have put real emphasis on making it easier for state and local uh, governments to access to federal funding. That is something that's been important in this administration to do. Uh, that's one reason we asked every state to appoint a state infrastructure coordinator uh, to help streamline uh, communications and information flow. And the White House infrastructure implementation team has also been engaging directly with state and
and local governments and tribal governments uh, to help them quickly access the necessary technical assistance and capacity to underserved uh, communities uh, in particular. So we have also partnered with nonprofit organizations to assist communities in assessing and deploying federal infrastructure funding, including Bloomberg, Philanthropies, uh, Immersion Collective, Ford Foundation, uh, and others, and so, so much more. Our goal is to help, again, state, local, uh, tribal, ter territorial governments navigate, uh, access, and deploy infrastructure resources that will build uh, a better America. This is why the, the president fought so hard uh, to get this bipartisan infrastructure law, a law that is historical and will make and will change uh, and will change the lives of so many Americans. So is it the view that because of what you guys have done that Jackson has had the access or the ability to tap into the funds you've allocated uh, to the degree they need in this moment. So again, we're we're our goal is to make it as easy as we can <laughs> for state and local governments to access those funds. Uh, we're gonna we have an implementation implement implementation team as I just uh, spoke <coughs> about, and uh, we're gonna continue to work with state and local governments. There's also non for profits on the ground and other organizations that we will work through. And uh, our hope is to uh, make sure that the the people of Jackson have what they need. And again, we've been in constant communication these past couple of days uh, with the mayor of Jackson, with local officials, uh, um, uh, the director of FEMA, Griswell, is going, will be there tomorrow. Uh, so as you have seen us in, in times like these, when there is um, a catastrophe, sadly, in these states, uh, we have, uh, the federal government has acted quickly uh, in, in order to help uh, the people in, in, that, in that community, in that state. And then one more question, just uh, with Jobs Day coming up, uh, it may sound a little bit paradoxical, but stick with me here. Given, given the robust kind of aggressiveness of the Fed chair in Jackson Hole, is there any concern that perhaps uh, a better than expected jobs report will create an economic response from the Fed that drives something the White House does not want? To? So as you know, Phil, we don't comment on um, the what um, what the Fed is going to do. Part of our uh, fighting inflation, the plan that the President has put forth, is to give them their independence uh, to make the monetary decision uh, to deal with inflation uh, that we see uh, across the country. And um, again, we believe like they have the best uh, monetary uh, uh, plans, policies uh, to make that happen. As it relates to the jobs, the jobs report, I spoke about this a couple times already. Look, you know, I don't want to get ahead of the numbers uh, tomorrow. We have been very clear that we see that um, the economy is in transition after a, uh, a historic economic growth that we saw last year, and we believe that we can continue uh, those gains. But again, we're in a transition uh, into a more stable and steady, uh, a steady growth. We won't see, we believe we won't see those the 600,000 numbers that we have seen uh, for some time, and uh, and that that number is going to be it's going to cool a little bit. You've heard us say that, uh, and so that's our anticipation, which we think uh, is where the economy uh, is going. But again, we have a strong labor market, which is important. Consumer spending uh, is up, is up. We see business investing. All of those things are, are critically and important. Um, and so we're going to look at all the economic data, but certainly I'm not, I'm not going to get ahead of uh, the job numbers for tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, I just want to circle back to uh, the Afghan uh, refugees. So just is any is the, anything being done for Afghan allies who or those uh, who have sought to come to the United States who already filed for parole and are currently waiting in the backlog of applications? And to be clear, are there only options now, as well as anybody trying to flee Afghanistan and come to the U.S., <laughs> either SIV or the refugee program? And I've Oh, sure. And as you know, there's a there's the act uh, that is in Congress that we have been really working, uh, that the, the administration continues to support the passage of the Afghan Adjustment Act to provide Afghans who have come to the U.S. through Operations Allies Welcome, which is what I talked through a second ago, and a pathway to durable immigration status. So there is that pathway as well that we're going to continue to work with uh, Congress on. Um, so. 
Oh, I'm sorry, but, but that they would need an approved application. Oh, absolutely. I'm just wanted to make I just wanted to make sure that I stated that as well. Look, as of August 9th, just to give you some numbers here, over 17,000 individuals have submitted all documents required to apply for Chief of Mission review uh, or are beyond the Chief of Mission stage. We are working to process those as quickly as possible and welcome them into the United States. So we this is something that we're working on uh, pretty regularly this is important uh, to the Department of State and so the Afghan SI program remains active uh, and uh, the state con continues to receive and process new SIV applications as expeditiously as possible as part of our efforts to improve the program we have cut the average uh, com review time to six of what it was under the previous administration from 510 days in June 2020 to 82 days in June 2022 I don't have the specific number as you were asking about the backlogs, uh, but we are quickly trying to move that forward, to move that through. Uh, and again, you know, uh, we have welcomed nearly 90,000 Afghans into the country thus far. Well, just reference though is the SIV application. Yes, it backlog. is. It is. So, but my question is, for those who have filed an application for parole, the oh, I'm so sorry. Ending, yes, I'm. I, I hear what you're saying. Will they still have a chance to get parole, or are they basically should they ditch? that just forget about the fact that they're in that pipeline and try to refer to That's a them. very good question. I would refer you to the Department of State on the on the parolees and the and where the ones who were kind of in that in that process and where they are going to ultimately be and what their what their uh, options are. I and don't have that specific lastly, with me. The two programs you referenced both still have years long backlogs even with the uh, movements that you were just describing to increase staff. Um, does the Biden administration think that at this point for somebody who's trying to flee Afghanistan and they're pursuing either SIV or the refugee program, that there's actually a realistic chance that they could make it through the pipeline within, I mean, the end of this presidential We're term? We're going to do everything that we can uh, to make sure that uh, we take care of um, the families, the American families uh, that are still in, Af in uh, Afghanistan and also uh, our friends and allies in Afghanistan as well. So we're going to do everything that we can uh, to make it happen. Uh, I know Department of State has been on top of this. They have been working through this, uh, you know, uh, for some time now. And so this is a priority of ours, for sure. If you could go back to uh, tonight's speech, you said the president is going to speak in a direct way about what he sees as a threat. Does that include former President Trump? Will he mention the former president by name or any Republicans? So, name? look, I've said this before. The president's never going to shy away uh, from talking about his predecessor. He hasn't. I'm about to answer your question. So give me a second. Uh, but it's not a, a speech about the former president uh, or about a single politician or about a political party. It's about the American democracy, which is what I've been trying to lay out here. This is so much broader, so much bigger uh, than any one party, than any one person. And it's an optimistic speech, again, about where we are as a nation and where we can go. And it's about the fundamental struggle around the globe between autocracy and democracy and how democracy is a critical foundation for this country uh, to move forward and about what we can do can be done right now to beat back the forces that are threatening that are threatening us and so he's been working on this for a while he's been thinking about the speech for a while he's talked about uh, soul of the nation the first time you heard him do that was when he woke wrote an op-ed in The Atlantic back in August of 2017. So this is nothing new uh, to him. He feels it is his responsibility to bring the to bring American people to together and to answer a fundamental question about what kind of nation we are going to be. And that's what you're going to hear uh, from the president tonight. Uh, again, he's been thinking about this for some time. Uh, this is a, not a new subject or topic for him. But if that includes things that you were saying to one of my colleagues' questions, you know, concern about this MAGA Republican, this extremist agenda, and that's something he's going to talk about tonight. How is that not a political Well, statement? I said he's not going to shy away from that. Um, and uh, of course, he's going to talk about voter participation. Of course, he's going to talk about um, uh, getting Americans to uh, get involved and participate in this effort to fight our democracy. That is something that he is certainly going to talk about. But what we're, what I'm trying to say is this is a broader speech, and you'll hear from him directly. Uh, this is not about uh, one political party. It is not what, about one political one person uh, in politics. Uh, this is about what we are going to do as a country 
uh, uh, to, uh, to continue to fight for our democracy. Again, something that he has talked about for some time, and, uh, and that's what you're going to hear from him. If you followed him through the campaign, if you followed him through the administration, uh, this is not new, and he will speak directly about that, directly about the current events. Uh, but again, he's not going to shy away uh, from, uh, from, from, from the extremism that we see today. Uh, but uh, again, this, there's a broader component of the speech, and you'll hear about that later this evening. Thanks, Green. Uh, on, on this Russian oil cap, uh, the U.S. is trying to get that in place before EU sanctions go into place in December that would ban seaborne shipments of Russian oil. Um, if the oil cap fails, what's the level of concern inside the administration that those EU san sanctions can drive up the price of oil and reverse all of the gains that um, you all have been touting for the past so, few months? I mean, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals from here. They're going to be meeting. The G7 finance minister, uh, minister's meeting is happening tomorrow, uh, so they'll have that discussion. Look, this is um, this is exactly what the president and G7 leaders have directed relevant members of, of their team to explore. As you know, the mechanism to set a global price tag, ta cap on uh, for Russia oil, you know, to starve, as you know, Putin of his main source of cash and force forcing down the price of Russian oil to help blunt the impact of Putin's war at the pump. They're going to meet tomorrow. Uh, as I said, the, the finance ministers, the G7 finance ministers uh, meeting, and, uh, and, uh, and we'll see what comes out of that. Don't want to get ahead of that meeting, which is happening tomorrow. Would the U.S. consider lifting its ban on imports of Russian oil if the price is capped? I, I, I'm just not going to get ahead of the, a meeting that's happening tomorrow. Too. Yeah, thank you. Um, given the ongoing threats of political violence and the majority of Americans saying they're concerned about American democracy and something like 40 percent of Americans saying that they think civil war could happen in the next 10 years, how is the president going to deliver an optimistic speech? How is he optimistic in the face of Have all you that? followed Joe Biden? Have you listened to him make speeches in the past before? Uh, this is a president, uh, I would argue, who knows how to do that, who knows how to deliver an optimistic speech, at the same time call out uh, what is happening in this moment. And that's what you're going to hear from this president. Um, you know, if you, if you look, listen to his past speeches, he has done that. How do we bring people together? How do we get people involved uh, in, this part, in this process, in this participation in our democracy? Uh, and look, be just because you call out what you're seeing in this current moment, uh, the extremism, the attack on our democracy, the attack on our freedom, um, the concerns that Americans have themselves, doesn't mean you can't bring the country to together and show a positive way forward, show some hope, give some people some hope. And you'll see that from this president tonight. Um, uh, completely unrelated, uh, also not a thing to be optimistic about. Um, the, the National Assessment of Educational Progress uh, is has this new testing that shows that nine-year-olds lost ground in both math and reading in pretty dramatic ways as a result of the pandemic. Um, what is the president going to do about it? What is the administration going to do about this severe learning loss? And does the administration shoulder any blame for not pushing schools to reopen sooner? So let's step back to where we were uh, not too long ago when this president walked into this administration, uh, how mismanaged uh, the pandemic, the response to the pandemic was, uh, how 47 percent of schools uh, were, uh, in, in less than six months, uh, our schools went from 40 per 46 percent uh, to, to open to nearly all of them being open to full time. That was the work of this president, and that was the work of Democrats, in spite of Republicans not voting for uh, the American Rescue Plan, which $130 billion went to school to have the ventilation, to be able to uh, have the tutoring and, and the teachers and being able to hire more teachers. And that was because of the work that this administration uh, did. We were, we were in a place where, uh, again, schools were not open. Uh, the economy was shut down. Businesses were shut down. And what we have seen is, uh, you know, we've seen the numbers, but I think that's what we see. That's how we saw. It, it shows you how mismanaged uh, the pandemic was uh, and how the impact of that mismanagement had on, the ch on, on kids' progress and academic well-being. And so, again, our priority remains to make sure states and schools and districts are using these funds, that $130 billion, billion dollars, 
Uh, this is going to go again to tutoring, to more teachers, real solutions, real solutions to make sure that our kids are getting what they need. And you know, every Republican Congress voted against that money. That is the reality. We had to do this on our own. And so, uh, you know, we're going to make sure that those funds are directed uh, to the, the most resources towards students who are, who will full, who will uh, who fell be the furthest behind, which is important. And we must repair the damage that was done by the last administration, the mismanagement that was done by the last administration. Uh, but again, this is uh, something that we take we took very seriously, which is why we passed the American Rescue Plan, which is why we put in 130 billion dollars to deal with. Uh, what we were seeing in schools. And so, um, you know, we're going to continue to make that, uh, to, to continue to do that work with, and work closely with the schools. And Kareen, um, two questions. One on uh, Jackson. It is in a state where this water crisis is one of the poorest states in the South. With that said, um, it's compounding, the water crisis is compounding so much negatively in that community. And I remember during the Bush years, during Hur Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans was set aside as a special case, as well as Detroit was set aside as a special case for them to work on revitalization, a renaissance, if you will. Is Jackson one of those places that this administration would hold in that kind of category because the economy is definitely impacted, poor state, et cetera. People are not working right now. It is unsanitary to go without water this way. Is Jackson one of those spaces that could have a, a, a special designation because of the compounding negatives and now this? So the Biden-Harris administration, we're committed to helping uh, the people of Mississippi cope with this current emergency. And we are going to continue to work with the state and local uh, government officials uh, to explore, I can tell you, all options uh, uh, to ensure that the people of Jackson have the access to your point to clean, safe drinking water. I don't have any announcement to make. Uh, I listed out yesterday the American Rescue Plan and uh, what that provided uh, for water upgrades, which was $450 million. Uh, $20 million went to, it went to Jackson, uh, has already gone to Jackson to address water and sewer infrastructure needs. The state also has about $75 million in bipartisan infrastructure law funding available to provide clean and safe water. And so we'll continue to partner closely. Uh, we're going to look at all options. I, I don't have anything for you at this time to announce. And lastly, I asked the same question a week ago. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow now, there's expected to be a civil rights meeting with the president. What can you read out about that meeting? I'm not going to comment about, about any potential meeting, expected meeting. I'm just not going to comment on that. But are we at a moment where the civil rights leaders and the president have a lot to talk about? Voting rights is gone. I mean, so many different issues that impact a community that's still underserved with some of the highest numbers of negatives in almost every category. So we have been uh, in Con had continued conversation with civil rights mem uh, members and leaders uh, since the beginning of this administration. We value those relationships. Uh, the president has met, as you know, with uh, civil rights leaders uh, during as president a few times, and we take, you know, we we um, we respect. Uh, uh, that that relationship, we expect our conversations that we have with them, and there's always a long list of things to talk about, uh, including uh, voting rights and so many other issues that affect different communities. I, I don't have anything more to share. I don't have an agenda uh, to share with you at this time. Uh, but that is a relationship that we have held uh, as an important one, uh, not just during the president's, uh, not just during uh, this administration uh, as president, but during vice president and also as senator. Um, a couple of months ago, the Creole did a story on the president's black agenda. He carries a card in his pocket, and on that, he writes things. And at some point in time, he had a list of items with a black agenda. Mm -hmm. What are some of those black agenda issues today, if you were to go to him and ask him if that's on his card? Look, when it comes to, um, if you look at the president's economic plan, he's been very deliberate 
if you, I just talked about the American Rescue Plan, I talked about the bipartisan infrastructure law, and how that plan is helping uh, the black community. I laid out what it's what we have uh, w what we have put forth to help Jackson, Mississippi. Um, but it's not just that. We know about education, what he's done for HBCUs, more than $6 billion that he has put forth, a historic amount of money to help HBCUs. So education has been really important. You think about the student loan, uh, um, a loan forgiveness that he put forward last week. That's going to help communities at need, right? It's going to help the folks that who are at the most risk. If you think about 90% of that plan is going to help people who are making under $75,000. That is part of the president's plan. Uh, if you think about going back to the bipartisan infrastructure law, that's going to um, that's going to uh, create jobs uh, for people. Ninety percent of what you see from that law is going to uh, uh, ninety percent. Uh, it's it's going to create jobs where uh, folks you know don't have to have a, a high school a college degree. That is going to be important. We're talking about building economic wealth. Uh, we're talking about having that generational wealth that's so important for brown, brown and black communities that they don't have. That's what the American Rescue Plan does, when it helps start bi small businesses, for, for folks to start small businesses so they can develop that uh, generational wealth. All of those things are part of what the president has worked on to make sure that he's building the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. So he's going to continue to do that work. It doesn't end there. We just passed the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. That's going to help many uh, communities as well. Lowers costs of prescription drugs. When you think about uh, uh, communities of color, how much our seniors uh, have to pay thousands of dollars a month on prescription drugs. So that work continues. Uh, it doesn't end. Uh, it doesn't end there. Uh, but we would say that there's been so much historic effort, uh, historic legislation that's been done un under this administration uh, that's going to help many communities, including the black community. I'll come back down. Go ahead. More on the soul of America from the back. I'll, I'll come in the back. What do you think the president's message tonight is for Americans who consider themselves Republicans or may uh, still support the former president? Is there something in the speech directed to them? Well. Look, the president really does believe that this, um, that what he's going to talk about um, is something that many Americans are going to care about. It doesn't matter which side of the aisle that you care, where that you sit at. When you think about the possibilities of our democracy, when you think about um, how we are going to fight for, to protect our rights, right, to protect our democracy. Uh, he thinks that's going to touch a lot of people. Uh, we have seen, somebody just talked about polling and how we see that many people are concerned about where our democracy is. Uh, I would argue that's probably across the board. Uh, and when we talk about the extremism, we're talking about a very small uh, piece, uh, a component of, uh, of the American public, right? We're talking about a very small component of, of uh, uh, MAGA Republicans in Congress, uh, that uh, that is something that they believe, right? But we know, and the president believes, uh, and is optimistic, that there are many, uh, many Americans who want to continue to make sure that we uphold our, our democracy. Uh, and so that is something uh, that um, that uh, we'll, we're going to hear some hope about the direction of America uh, and the future of America, building toward a more perfect union. Uh, that is something that we have heard throughout our history in this country. And, uh, and so he's going to speak directly to them. He's going to make the case. He's going to be optimistic. He's going to lay a, a path forward. Uh, and, um, and that's what matters. And that's why it's not, he's not going to focus on a political party. He's not going to fo focus on a political person. He's going to focus at what, is, what matters, what is currently mattering in this moment and as it is at the heart of who we are as a country. Talk about who we are as a country. And, um, and that's what you're going to hear from the president. Hold on, hold on. Come to the back. Go ahead. I just want to try again on um, oil price caps. Uh, the Russian deputy prime minister said today that Russia will not export oil to the world market if the price is capped below the cost of production. So, given those comments, it's not in entirely hypothetical. Given he's said that, 
Is the White House concerned that Russia would refuse to sell oil under the cap, which would then cut off supply and potentially raise prices? Again, the meeting is happening tomorrow. I'm going to let the G7 uh, finance ministers meeting occur, and uh, we'll get back to you on that. But just want to just lay out what we've done already, the strong actions that we have taken uh, to ban Russian oil, and U.S. allies have, have announced plans to wind down their own imports of Russian oil. We've heard them make those, those uh, announcement. Uh, and, uh, you know, but Putin has continued to try to find new markets uh, for Russian oil. So this is the most effective way, we believe, to hit hard uh, at Putin's revenue, and doing so will result in not only a drop in Putin's oil uh, revenue, but also global energy prices. So we're going to continue to um, uh, continue to have our uh, conversations uh, with the G7 leaders. This is what's going to happen tomorrow with the foreign, uh, the finance ministers, and we'll have more to share. I'm going to go to the back because people have been saying I'm not going to. Go ahead, Phil. And then I'll come around. Phil. Go ahead, Thanks, Phil. Thanks, um, great. Returning to our discussion yesterday and following up on some of the things that you said today, I just want to clarify, does the President believe that the effort to restrict abortion, uh, to restrict that freedom, is semi-fascism? Say that. How is this connected to yesterday? I'm just trying to think. So, in terms of uh, extremism, the extremism conversation that we were having yesterday, does the president believe that the effort to restrict abortion, whether it's at the local level or the federal level, to restrict that freedom, does he believe that that is semi-fascist? I mean, he was very clear. He was very clear that uh, mega re Republicans in Congress have an agenda that is extreme, and that's what you hear from them. The national ban on abortion is extreme and also is not in line with where a majority of Americans are. It is just not. It is taking away people's rights. It is taking away people's freedoms. Uh, and, you know, he doesn't, he believes that is an extreme agenda. You've heard that from him directly. I don't even need to confirm that from here. Uh, he's actually talked about how extreme it is when we saw what, what was done with the Dobbs decision on June 24th. Uh, to take away uh, a right that people had for 50 years, a constitutional right for 50 years that women had to make a decision for themselves uh, on their health care. And, uh, and so, yeah, we see that as extreme. So, but I'm trying to figure out which bucket in particular to put it in, because the administration as well as the president has used different language here. There's extremism, and then there's also the semi-fascism. Uh, moniker that he used. I mean, the, this is an effort that's been around for a long time. Does he believe that this movement working through, whether it's the state legislature or Congress, is in either of those buckets? When we talk about um, semi-fascism um, and you talk about the attack on our democracy, that's what we're talking about, right? An attack on our democracy. Uh, that's what we're seeing. Attack on our, uh, on our freedoms. That's what we're seeing. Uh, from the MAGA Republicans in Congress. That is what they're doing. That is when you're talking about inciting violence, that's, that's, that is an attack on our democracy. And when, you're, when you see a mob uh, that is attacking the ca Capitol and you don't call that out, or you call it out one day and then change your mind the other day, another day, uh, what, is, what message are you say, saying about our democracy? But specifically with regards to limiting these freedoms, I guess my question is, the Supreme Court created this space for at the anti-abortion movement at the state level and also perhaps at the federal level to try and restrict this freedom. Where do they fit into all of this? How would the president describe them after that decision? Were they just extremists or were they, you know, part and parcel of a semi-fascist? Look, here's what I'll say. Um, We can continue to see attacks on people's fundamental rights, right, um, of Americans with new abortion laws across the country. And when you have <coughs> national Republicans uh, who are who are leaders uh, in their in their political party who sit in office, uh, who say that they want to take away the rights, uh, even in case of incest, in case in in and in, in not and in, in, in case of uh, um, of rape and taking away uh, the, a woman's right to make a decision on her body. That's extreme. Uh, and, um, and, you know, the president's going to call that out. He's going to continue to do everything that he can to make sure that uh, we protect people's freedoms. 
Uh, he's going to do everything that he can to call that out. Uh, and, you know, that is important to call out. That is important to talk about. And again, we see majority of Americans who disagree. And so when you are not with where majority of Americans are, then, you know, that is extreme. That is an extreme way of thinking. Uh, I'm not going to, th that's what I have for you, Phil. I'm, I just laid out what he's going to talk about. It's not a political part. It's not about a political person. It's not about a political party. It's about where we are currently today in, um, it, where we are currently today with our democracy. Thank right? you, Great. All right. Thanks, Great. Um, has the administration seen a spike in the request for COVID free at home tests since the deadline is tomorrow? Has there been an increase this week on so, the website? Yeah, there has been a significant increase this week in demand uh, since uh, we announced the suspension, as you know, which is happening tomorrow of the covidtest.gov. Uh, because of a lack of funding from Congress and as we prepare ahead of the winter, we had to make uh, some tough decisions. Look, millions of orders have been placed. Uh, this is a testament of how strong the demand of a popular program uh, has been. Americans want ready access to tests to protect themselves and others. With more funding, we'd expeditiously resume the program. That's what we're hoping to do. Uh, and we're going to continue uh, to work with Congress on getting that funding. But everybody who requested them this week will be able to get the order. We're going to do everything that we can to make sure that uh, um, we get people their, their tests. One more COVID question. Uh, with uh, the new boosters likely uh, rolling out next week after the FDA gave the EUA uh, yesterday, um, with pharmacies now being told to retire the old boosters and now going forward only the new boosters will be given out, what happens to all of those old boosters? Can they be reused, repurposed? Can they be donated to other countries? Or will they be just wasted at this point? So that's something that I, uh, I can't speak from here. That's going to be something that the FDA will clearly um, give some guidance on. All right. Uh, I'll come back to Thank you. Uh, go back to tonight's speech. Obviously, you said that the president is going to be calling out these lawmakers that are MAGA lawmakers in Congress. But you had 74 million people vote for Trump last time around. You said it's a small number of the, the White House police are extremists. Can you give us an idea of ballpark? Are we talking a million of that 74 million? Are we talking about 1%, 20%? What kind of number are we talking well, about? Well, I'm, um, I'm talking about specifically of uh, MAGA office holders. That's what we're talking about. They're Not the ones. We're ta I'm talking specifically. I already answered this question uh, about how um, you know, we feel like we've touched a nerve. Right when when folks are are, are saying uh, that we're we're trying to be div divisive or that we're talking about millions of voters, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about mag MAGA office holders uh, who who uh, who have put forth an agenda that is uh, extreme, who have put forth an agenda that takes away uh, people's rights, who have put forth an uh, agenda that. Uh, you know, want to give tax cuts to billionaires and corporations while raising taxes on million Americans. Uh, we I just had a back and forth about uh, how uh, they want to do a national ban. They've called for a national ban on abortion. Those are extreme. Uh, that's an extreme agenda that is not in line where majority of Americans are. I know you're asking me about uh, 10 millions of, of voters out there, but we're talking about if you look at the items that I just listed, majority of Americans. Uh, don't support what the MAGA Republicans in Congress are doing. That's a fact. That's what polling shows us. When you're talking about an agenda uh, from Republicans in the Senate who are talking about getting rid of uh, Medicare, putting that on the chopping block, putting Social Security on the chopping block, that's not popular. That's not something that majority of Americans want. So if it's MAGA office holders, we've seen Democratic groups, something like the Democratic Governors Association, boost Trump candidates like Maryland. You think of uh, Dan Cox, who just uh, got the nomination. Is that then hypocritical if you're saying we've got to make sure these MAGA supporters are not in office, but you've got Democratic groups that are boosting their campaigns in the primaries? I, I mean, I can't talk about campaigns and what another another candidate is doing or a committee is doing. I can't speak from that uh, from here. Uh, look, I can say this. The president has, been, has always been clear. Uh, there are going to be people who disagree. Uh, with his programs and legislative priorities, and that's what democracy is all about. Like, we understand that, right? But people accept elections and we move forward as a nation, right? But there is a growing number of people who refuse to 
uh, accept the results of free and fair elections, people who actually openly talking about subverting elections in the future. This is not a speech where he's going to tell people to vote for one party or the other. That's not what he's going to do. Uh, he's going to, I'm talking about tonight, I'm talking about tonight. He's going to talk about uniting the people of this country who believe in equality and democracy. And this is about bringing people together who believe in America. That's what the speech is going to be about, and that's what he's going to focus on. And obviously, there's been a lot of focus on previous speeches, previous comments, one in Maryland the other day. Is it only on the far right that deserves to be called out, or are there elements of the far left that also deserve to be either scrutinized or lectured? Look, I'm, I'm, I just laid out there's going to be some people who agree with him and who disagree with him. Uh, who agree, who, uh, whether it's legislative uh, initiatives or programs. That's going to happen. Uh, but what we're going to hear from him is how to move the country forward. That's going to be the focus of the speech tonight. Uh, he's going to be, it's going to be optimistic, it's going to be hopeful, uh, and it's, but it's also going to lay out what's going on currently in this moment. That's what you can expect from him uh, tonight. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're going to try and see how we can move this country forward. Last one for me is, you know, he's going back to Pennsylvania tonight. He's going on Monday for Labor Day. He's doing Wisconsin. You know, everybody here has been asking about Mississippi. No plans to go see what's going on on the ground? Uh, I just said the FEMA administrator. Going, well, well, I, just, I just said the FEMA administrator is going there tomorrow. That's going to be important. She is, she is the administrator of FEMA, one of the most important uh, 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 agencies as we're, as we're dealing with, the, with this catastrophe that we see in Jackson. That is not unusual. Uh, that is not new for her to be the first one on the ground uh, to, to make sure to get a sense of what's happening and what is going on. We're, you know, we have the EPA, uh, EPA who's also involved, uh, the EPA and, uh, agency who's also involved as well. Uh, the president's going to continue to have conversations with local governments, the local elected officials in, in the state, and, uh, and our team is going to continue to do that. Uh, I just don't have anything else to preview, but it is not unusual right, to have the but FEMA court. and then the president. I'm not saying that. I, I just said I don't have anything to preview, but it's not unusual for her to go down there, uh, as we've seen with other, uh, where we have other catastrophes, sadly, across the country, uh, and FEMA takes takes ash, action, and then it take the lead. Can I have a follow-up on this speech, back. please? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned autocracy and democracies will be part of the uh, theme that the president will uh, touch on to, uh, today. Does that mean that he's returning to um, you know, the, the kind of foreign policy theme that he's often highlighted in the beginning of his, his administration? Will there be a foreign po policy component in the speech? And he'll, will he mention specific <coughs> countries? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of the president. I just laid out it's going to be an optimistic speech. It's going to be about um, how where our country is currently and fighting for our democracy, how we're going to uh, move forward, uh, and, uh, and also how Americans can also participate in making sure that uh, we protect what's important uh, to us as a country. There's going to be autocracy. Yeah, he'll, 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 I said he'll talk about that, but you're asking me specific things. I'm just not going to get ahead of the president. I just laid out what he believes he wants to, to talk about tonight, uh, what he believes this moment is all is all about. Remember, we're going to do this at Independence Hall, which is a historic, uh, which is a historic p place to do this speech. Uh, so this is an important moment, doing it in prime time, making sure that uh, he connects with the American people. And again, this is something that we believe majority of Americans care about. Uh, and so you'll hear from the president tonight. And just another follow-up on Afghanistan uh, from my colleagues. Um, I understand the focus now is on the SID program, but just to follow up on a more brief note, I think earlier this month, I believe August 5th, you said that the withdrawal anniversary is an opportunity to honor the lives that we lost and recognize the lives that we saved and how we are on a stronger strategic footing now that we've uh, ended the war. Um, and so it seemed at that time that the administration was, at least, I mean, to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, planning to mark the event in a way that would highlight those issues that you mentioned at that time. But instead, we have this narrow statement from the president, not on the withdrawal itself, but on the anniversary of the Kabul airport attack. So can you explain the thinking behind the, that messaging strategy? And could you please respond to the criticism that the administration's goal here is to downplay the withdrawal anniversary and kind of just put it in a rear view mirror as soon so as possible? I'll, so I'll say a few things. We remain committed to supporting um, the Afghan people, and uh, we are proud to be the largest single provider 
uh, just to remind you all of humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. We are working closely uh, with uh, the United Nations and other partners to provide the assistance directly to the Afghan people without benefit to the Taliban. Uh, we will remain vigilant against any terrorist threats as we demonstrated in July uh, when we took down or took out the, uh, the leader of al-Qaeda. Uh, we will continue to prioritize relocation effort for our Afghan allies and welcome our Afghan allies to the United States since our commitment to them is enduring. And we will continue to press uh, the Taliban for the safe release of Mark Ferrix and to respect the human rights and fundamental freedoms of all Afghans, including women and girls. That is our goal. That is our commitment. That has been our commitment uh, for more than a year now. And, uh, and uh, again, we are committed to supporting the Afghan people, and we will do everything that we can in what I just listed. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Green. So you read at the top of this about the president's uh, statement on manufacturing and announcement of those new jobs. When will those jobs materialize? And when the government subsidies go away, like the CHIPS Act and American Rescue Plan, will those jobs also go away? So um, look, the reason that we announced these, uh, what we announced what Ma uh, Macron is doing for solar, Toyota, Honda, and Corning, if you think about Macron, uh, they're going to a $15 billion investment over the next 10 years. Uh, that is going to create a lot of jobs. Uh, and that's going to be in Idaho. Look, they're going to, I'm sure they'll share more on what that process is going to look like. But the point that we're making is because of the work that we've done, the CHIPS Act, let's remember, that was actually a bipartisan piece of legislation. The fact that we were able to come together to work on this important uh, manufacturing uh, bill, right, that's going to help uh, make sure that we create semiconductors here. That's what this, uh, th what, that's what this manufacturing facility is going to be about, making sure that we strengthen our supply chain, making sure that we strengthen our national security, making sure that we're doing the made in America. Uh, that is an important uh, step forward. And so they'll provide more information, but certainly $15 billion that they say that they're going to invest and create their first manufacturing to deal with semiconductors, that's an important step forward. And that's because of the work that this administration done. And that's why we highlighted it. So I want to ask you about campaign promises. Uh, well, candidate Biden said he would end the fossil fuels uh, industry. Then he went back and said that he's not going to end all fossil fuels. Um, we've seen increased regulations and restrictions uh, in that industry. Pennsylvania is the third largest coal producer in the United States. In the past year, we've only seen about 1,600 jobs uh, in net added to mining and lodging in that state. Um, so why not just change the energy policies, help out Pennsylvania with jobs and energy security? Look, we just passed the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which is going to uh, uh, which is going to do, which is going to change people's lives and is the most uh, which is the most historic investment that we'll see, uh, that we have seen in this country uh, to deal with climate change, right? To deal with, um, to deal with energy. And so that is important there. And let's not forget the bipartisan infrastructure, infrastructure uh, law as well that's going to deal with uh, climate change. And so, look, we're going to continue to do the work. This is a commitment that the president has. Uh, he has created, as you know, you've heard me say this, uh, almost 10 million jobs, new jobs since he's gotten into office. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, infrastructure law is going to create jobs where you're not going to need a college degree. That's important. 90% of those jobs, you won't need a college degree. Uh, that's going to be important to Pennsylvania. That's going to be important to many communities across the country. And he's going to do this in a way uh, that he's, he's, he's going to meet his campaign promises. And so when it comes to uh, the, climate, the climate change and fighting climate change, when it comes to making sure that we're creating jobs, when it comes to building up uh, the, uh, the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. That's what he's committed, and that's what you see from all of the pieces of legislation that has come out of this legislation when it deals with the economy. Thanks, okay. okay. All right. I'll be back tomorrow, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.